Um, I just want to add to Anastasia's introduction that um, I don't come from a farming background. Um, I was born and raised in, in Montreal and um, I've been living abroad for about 15 years and moved back to Canada recently. I started researching issues surrounding intellectual property and agriculture as a doctoral student at McGill about 15, over 15 years ago now. And I was um, inspired at the time by the work of Jack Kloppenberg, who wrote a really important book called First the Seed, which is very essential reading to understand the political economy of seeds. And I was also um, influenced and inspired at the time by the work of uh, ETC Group. And I saw that uh, Jim Thomas presented um, last month at NFU University. Um, and I also want to say that I seldom have the opportunity to present my research to farmers who are on the front lines of the issues I'm researching. So I was really happy when Caddy invited me to participate um, in NF University. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about um, what I'll be presenting now. So Caddy asked me to talk about seed activism, which has really been surging in the past two or three decades. And I've put just a few examples on this slide um, to show the diversity of movements and initiatives and strategies that, that we're seeing. So at the top here, you have the Ban Terminator campaign that happened in 2006. And this is a picture um, from the meeting of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Brazil. It's um, a protest by women of La Via Campesina against this type of technology. Here you have the Faucheur Volontaire in France, uh, known as the Voluntary Reapers in English of GM crops. You have the March Against Monsanto, which started in California and spread around the world. At the bottom here, uh, bottom right corner, you have a seed fair, and that's a picture I took in southern Brazil around 2008, but these, this kind of event is happening all over the world. Uh, here you have the La Via Campesina um, seed sovereignty campaign that was uh, relaunched recently. And um, here is the logo of the open source seed initiative uh, in the US. So, I wanna show this diversity because in my talk today, I will focus on one very specific dimension, which is activism around legislative changes to seed and plant breeders rights laws. And um, let me open a parenthesis here. Plant breeders rights or PBR and plant variety protection or PVP are, um, are the same. And I will use both expressions um, interchangeably in my talk. Now, the reason Cathy asked me to talk about these issues is that the NFU has been involved for many years in opposing amendments to the Canadian PBR Act and Seeds Act. And so the idea is to reflect on the Canadian experience based on what is happening in other countries. And of course, from a farmer's perspective, um, these laws are important because they determine what a farmer can and cannot do with seeds. Um, so first, I will talk about an organization called UPOV, which some of you may know, because it is a major player on issues related to plant breeders' rights, and I'll keep referring to it throughout my, my talk, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll talk about debates around plant breeders' rights in four countries. So I chose to talk about Brazil, India, Norway, and New Zealand. Um, I chose these countries for a variety of reasons. I wanted to include countries from the global south as well as from the global north in order to show that these trends that I'll be discussing are really global. I also wanted to include at least one country that is um, similar to Canada in terms of its agriculture, which is um, New Zealand. And I also chose these countries because they have different um, statuses or different relationships with um, UPOV. And uh, I will conclude by drawing some general observations about activism around the uh, plant breeders rights laws based on, on these uh, countries. So UPOV is the French acronym for the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. It was established in Paris in 1961 by a handful of European countries to promote plant breeders rights. So UPOV is an intergovernmental organization but it promotes the interest of the plant breeding industry. So it's kind of a hybrid. It's an intergovernmental body, but at the same time, it's, it's very much an industry lobby group. 
Now, what are plant breeders' rights? Plant breeders' rights are often described as soft patents. Um, it's a form of intellectual property on plant varieties that, contrary to patents, allow for exceptions to the exclusive rights of the owner. So historically, at least, the protected variety could be freely used for further research, for plant breeding, and so farmers could save seeds for replanting. So these were the three exceptions to plant breeders' rights. But the tendency over time has been to reinforce plant breeders' rights so that these exceptions are increasingly restricted and plant breeders' rights are becoming more and more similar to patent rights. It's important to know that there are two versions of the UPOV convention in effect today. So countries are either party to the 1978 act or to, to the 1991 act. So Canada, for example, is a party to the 1991 act. Now, countries that joined UPOV before 1999 have the option of remaining a party to the 78 act. Countries that join UPOV after 1999 must do so under, under the 1991 Act. They no longer have the option. Um, and this is important because there are significant differences between the two versions of the convention, which I've summarized in this table. And I won't get into the details of, of these provisions, but what I want to show with this table is that UPOV 91 does two things. The first thing it does is that it reinforces plant breeders' rights by expanding their scope and their duration. So you can see that um, the, the protection is extended under UPOV 91 to all genera and species of plants. The minimum term of protection is extended from 15 to 20 years. And uh, the scope of protection is also expanded, uh, for example, to harvested materials as opposed to only seeds. Now, the second thing that UPOV 91 does is that it restricts the exceptions to plant breeders' rights. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention in this table to the farmer's exception. Under UPOV 78, farmers can use, save, and exchange a protected variety as long as these uses are non-commercial. Under UPOV 91, this, is, um, this becomes an optional exception, so it is up to national laws. It is restricted to a farmer's own use, so no more seed exchange among neighbors, for example. And it, this exception has to be within reasonable limits and is subject to safeguarding the legitimate interest of the breeder. So it is um, significantly more narrow, this exception, under uh, UPOV 91 than um, it was under UPOV 78. And when you combine these two aspects, you end up with plant breeders' rights that are more exclusive and more similar to patents. Now I want to comment briefly on the relationship between UPOV and the WTO, the World Trade Organization. UPOV remained a small organization until the 1990s. In 1995, the WTO was created and one of its founding agreements is the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, the TRIPS Agreement. Now, this agreement makes it compulsory for the first time for countries to provide patents on biotechnology and some form of IP protection for plant varieties, which most countries at the time didn't provide because, and it is important to remember that, the free flow of plant genetic resources was considered until then to be in the public interest. Now, in the aftermath of, of the WTO TRIPS agreement, UPOV skillfully lobbied governments around the world to fulfill their TRIPS obligation by joining UPOV. But in doing so, countries gave up the possibility to develop more flexible laws adapted to their conditions, and they committed to stronger intellectual property rights for plant varieties than was required by the TRIPS agreements. The pressure to join UPOV comes primarily um, from the US, but also from other countries. So the European Union, Switzerland, Canada, Japan, South Korea, and obviously from UPOV itself and uh, the plant breeding industry. This is a map of membership in UPOV. Um, so you can see in green are UPOV members. Um, there's 77 members in total including two institutional members, it's the European Union and the African IP organization. Um, 
Unfortunately, this map does not distinguish between UPOV 78 and 91 members, but um, only 17 countries today are still party to UPOV 78, and they're mostly located in, in Latin America. Now in red and orange um, are the countries that are not member of, of UPOV, and as you can see, they're mostly located in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Southeast Asia. Um, India here is the only large agricultural country that is not a member of UPOV, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Brazil, Norway, and New Zealand are all parties to um, the 1978 Act. Okay, so moving to the case studies now. Um, I'll start with Brazil. So Brazil is typical in that it did not offer plant breeders rights prior to uh, the creation of the World Trade Organization. In 1997, it passed its first PPP Act that was modeled on UPOV 78 to fulfill its obligations under the TRIPS agreement. This PVP bill prompted a lot of debates and opposition at the time. Um, it was opposed by family farming organizations. These organizations were not able to stop the bill from going through, but they succeeded in broadening the scope of the farmer's exception. So under the PVP Act in Brazil, all farmers are allowed to store and plant seeds for their own use. And small rural producers can also multiply seeds to give away or exchange, but only among themselves. Um, under the Seed Act, which was uh, revised in 2003, family farmers, land reform settlers, and indigenous people can multiply seeds and seedlings to give away, exchange, or commercialize among themselves. And they're also exempt from registering um, their varieties. And the difference, of course, is that the Seed Act applies to all seeds, whereas the PVP Act only applies to seeds that are covered by plant breeders' rights. Now, since 2007, there have been several attempts to, at amending the PVP Act and bring it into line with UPO 91. Um, at least seven bills have been introduced in Congress. These bills, they vary in the specifics, but they all have in common strengthening plant breeders' rights, restricting the farmer's exception, at least for large farmers, who would no longer be allowed to save seeds for replanting without paying royalties what is known here in Canada as endpoint royalties and already exist in Brazil for GM crops. Um, and these bills also um, strengthen sanctions for infringing plant breeders' rights. Now, as some of you may know, the Brazilian countryside is highly polarized um, between small farmers um, and land reform settlers on the one hand and large farmers and agribusiness on the other. But interestingly, these sectors whose interests often clash, have come together to oppose amendments to the PVP Act. So now let me nuance what I just said, because part of the agribusiness lobby supports amending the PVP Act, but other parts do not. And it is these disagreements within the agribusiness lobby that have so far stopped any bill from going through. Now moving to India. Um, so, Brazil is a typical case of a country that joined UPOV 78 and introduced PVP legislation because of the TRIPS agreement. India, in contrast, is quite, quite unique and, and quite atypical. So in the mid 1990s, the Indian government introduced a PVP bill to fulfill its obligation under the TRIPS agreement. Um, the original bill was largely based on UPOV 78. However, this bill prompted mass demonstration by farmers. They were called seed protests at the time, similar to the kind of massive farmers mobilizations that we've seen um, in the past month in Delhi, but this time against the deregulation of um, agricultural prices. So in response to these, um, these, these mobilization, the government organized public consultation throughout India. And after seven years and five different drafts, the act was finally passed in 2001. India is one of the few countries um, in the world that has taken advantage of the option under the TRIPS agreement to develop its own um, kind of legislation. It is called the Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers' Rights Act, and it includes a full chapter on farmers' rights. Um, in my view, the most 
outstanding provision and one that civil society really fought for is that farmers have the right to save, use, sow, resow, exchange, share, or even sell seeds, including from protected varieties, as well as harvested materials in the same manner as they were entitled before the coming into force of the act. The only restriction is that a farmer cannot sell branded seeds of a protected variety if they are labeled as such. The act also includes uh, a number of um, original provisions. For example, farmers are recognized as breeders in the same way as public and commercial breeders, and they can apply for plant breeders rights on their varieties. Farmers cannot be held responsible for infringing breeders' rights if they can show that they did so unknowingly, and this is known as innocent infringement. Farmers are entitled to compensation if a variety does not perform as advertised. And the, the, the act also includes provisions for access and benefit sharing in cases where farmers' varieties are used in the development of commercial varieties. Now, this is all very nice on paper. Um, the problem is that many of these provisions have uh, remained dead letter. Now, it's important to say that India was able to do this, to pass this original piece of legislation because it is not a member of UPOV. A member of UPOV would not be allowed to have these uh, kind of provisions, farmers' rights provision, even under the 1978 Act, let alone under, under, under the 1991 Act. Now, UPOV was obviously very keen um, to bring such a large country as India on board, so much so that it was ready to open an exception for India to join under the 78 Act, even if it was no longer allowed after 1999. And this was a recognition that UPOV 91 was simply out of the question in India. So in 2002, less than a year after the PPV and FR Act was adopted, it came out that the government was considering joining UPOV. And this uh, really came as a shock to all those who had been involved in this issue on, on the PPV and FR Act, because it would have essentially undone everything that had been achieved with the PPV and FR Act. Basically, in order for India to join UPOV, it would have had to uh, repeal the Act. What happened then is that an NGO called Gene Campaign filed a public interest lawsuit on the grounds that India was under no legal obligation to join UPOV because the PPV and FR Act already fulfilled its TRIPS commitment, that doing so would constitute a violation of its own legislation as well as of the constitution, and that it would also constitute a violation of India's international obligations under the Convention on on biological diversity and the FAO seed treaty, because these uh, provide for farmers' rights and for um, access and benefit sharing. In response to the lawsuit, the government backtracked, and the matter of India joining UPOV has been on the ice ever since. And I don't see um, India joining UPOV anytime soon. Um, this is all the more remarkable that if it was not for civil society and farmers' mobilization, India would certainly have joined UPOV, as was the government's initial intention. Remember that the original bill was modeled on UPOV 78. And just a quick note on trade agreements. So India was initially part of the negotiations of the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is a regional trade agreement. But India walked out of the negotiations in 2019, and there were several reasons, but one of them was the obligation to join UPOV 91, which was very uh, controversial in India. Now, Norway. So Norway passed its first Planned Breeders' Rights Act um, quite late in 1993 in preparation for joining the World Trade Organization. And it did join a UPOV the same year. So its legislation is based on UPOV 78. Um, but there's something interesting about Norway's legislation um, and it's that farmers' rights over protected varieties are not explicitly regulated. So in most countries, um, including Canada, there's an article in the PBR Act that is usually called some exceptions to, to the breeder's right. And under that article, it says what a farmer is allowed to do with protected varieties. In the Canadian PBR Act, for example, there's a farmer's privilege provision, 
And just a parenthesis here, I, I don't like the expression privilege because a privilege is by definition sub, something that can be taken away, right? As opposed to something to which someone is entitled. So um, I prefer to talk about farmer's rights than farmer's privilege. Um, but in Norway, in contrast, the farmer's exception is implicit. So this is not stated anywhere, but the understanding is that farmers are entitled to save seeds from their harvest of protected varieties for replanting in the following season. And farmers can also exchange protected seeds among themselves, but, are, but they cannot sell them. Now in 2005, a draft law that would have brought Norway's PBR Act into line with UPOV 91 was made available for public consultation. Now the main farmers unions and some members of the scientific community opposed that bill. And later that year, an alliance of socialist, labor, and environmentalist parties formed the government. Um, a former member of the main National Farmers Union was appointed as the Minister of Agriculture. And one of his first decisions in office was to reject the bill to amend the PBR Act on the ground that it would undermine farmers' rights. More specifically, the government argued that the amendments would have imposed too many limitations on farmers' rights to save, reuse, and exchange seeds and that they would have forced farmers to buy seeds every year. So as a result of this um, decision, Norway's PBR Act has remained essentially unchanged since 1993. And Norway stands out as a country, I personally do not know of any other, uh, where the government took an official stance to remain party to UPOV 78 because it offers, in its view, a better balance between farmers' rights and plant breeders' rights. Now, Norway has played an important role in the international negotiations of the FAO Plan Treaty, uh, which is the first international treaty to acknowledge farmers' rights. But ironically, given Norway's decision to upheld its right to remain a party to UPOV 78 and its role in the negotiation of the, the Plan Treaty, um, Norway has promoted UPOV 91 in trade agreements with countries in the global south through its membership in the European Free Trade Association, the EFTA. This association is made up of four non-EU European countries. So it's Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. The EFTA has entered into a number of bilateral uh, trade agreements, uh, including with Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Indonesia, and a number of Central American countries that require membership in UPOV 91, which is all the more shocking given that Norway considers it is in its own best interest to remain with UPOV 78. And finally, New Zealand. So the case of New Zealand is really interesting, but it is also quite complex. Um, New Zealand joined UPOV under the 1978 Act in 1981 and adopted its first, it's called there, the Plant Variety Rights Act in 1987. So farmers are allowed to save seeds for planting on their own, uh, on their farms. Now, a review of the PVR Act began in the late 1990s, and it mainly focused on whether New Zealand should accede to UPOV 91. However, the review process was put on hold for two reasons. The first one is that there were concerns that UPOV 91 could violate the government's obligation towards um, indigenous people, the Maori people, under the Treaty of Waitangi. And, and second, the review was also put on hold because of the negotiations of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which included an obligation to join UPOV 91. So I'll talk about each of these two um, aspects in turn. Um, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840 between the indigenous Maori tribes and the British Crown. A tribunal was established in 1975 to investigate possible breaches by the government of its obligations under the treaty and um, had the power to make recommendations. Now, one of the claims that was filed by Maori people in the tribunal concerned the recognition and protection of the Maori relationship to indigenous flora and fauna and of Maori traditional knowledge. Now, because of this uh, claim before the tribunal, the government decided to wait for the report of the tribunal before proceeding with the revision of the PVR Act, because there was a real concern that UPOV 91 could violate the treaty. 
The tribunal took three decades to issue its final report. It did so in 2011, and it made a number of recommendations concerning PVP specifically. And I'll come back to these um, recommendations in a moment. Now, in the meantime, the revision of the PVR Act was further delayed because of the negotiations of the um, TPP. So like Canada, New Zealand is part of what started as the TPP and became the CPTPP um, following the withdrawal of the US. So it's the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Under this agreement, countries must accede to UPOV 91. However, because this was an issue for New Zealand, its government negotiated a special annex to the agreement that says that New Zealand commits by the end of this year, by the end of uh, December, by December 2021, to either accede to UPOV 91 or adopt a sui generis PVP system that would give effect to UPOV 91. Sui generis mean of its own kind. Now, New Zealand is going for the second option, obviously. And what that means is that it will officially remain a member of UPOV 78, but it will revise its PVR Act to implement most of the provisions of UPOV 91. But by doing so, it will retain the flexibility to avoid implementing those UPOV 91 provisions that would violate the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, the text of the new bill has not yet been public. It is set to be introduced in Parliament in any time now, in the coming uh, weeks or months. But based on a cabinet paper, we have a good idea of what the government's proposals are. And these proposals um, come from the report of the tribunal um, in large part. So first, some of the ideas that have been, that are made in this uh, cabinet paper um, are the inclusion of disclosure requirements in applications for plant breeders rights. So that's an obligation for the applicant to disclose the origin of any genetic resources or traditional knowledge used in, their, um, in developing um, the plant variety for which they're applying for plant breeders rights. Um, it's important to say that disclosure of origin is an obligation under the FAO plant treaty but UPOV does not allow such requirements. And this is one of the areas where the UPOV convention clashes with other international treaties. A second proposal is the ability to refuse the grant of plant variety rights if Maori relationship are affected and cannot be mitigated to a reasonable extent. A third proposal that uh, was made in that cabinet paper is that the commissioner could refuse a name for a new variety if the registration or use of that name would offend a significant section of the Maori community. And the fourth proposal is the establishment of a Maori advisory committee with uh, the chair of that committee sitting alongside the commissioner when Maori interests are involved. So it will be interesting to see what happens um, in the coming year as New Zealand introduces its revised um, PVR bill, and we can see the content of the bill. Um, and most importantly, if these proposals will be effective in protecting the rights of uh, Maori people, and there are real concerns that um, they might not, but that remains to be seen. Um, if there are two takeaways from the experience of New Zealand, I think that the first one would be the recognition that plant breeders' rights and UPOV 91 can violate indigenous rights, something that the government of New Zealand is openly um, acknowledging. Um, the second point is that um, the New Zealand uh, government concluded that, and I quote from uh, a government report, there's no evidence that New Zealand is currently missing out on new plant varieties, either through foreign breeders not bringing their IP here, or through domestic research and development being hampered by insufficient return on investment in breeding programs. And um, the reason this is significant is that the main argument put forward by the plant breeding industry to, put, to push for stronger plant breeders' rights and for UPOV 91 is that it is necessary to attract private investment and, and to um, obtain better plant varieties, but this claim is not necessarily backed by evidence and um, um, that was not the conclusion of uh, the New Zealand government. So 
I would like to wrap up with six general observations based on um, these four countries' experience. First, and it is easy to forget this, but planned breeders' rights are a recent phenomenon, not only in the global south, but also in the global north. So Canada, for example, did not have planned breeders' rights legislation in place before 1990. Second, another point I would like to emphasize because there are a lot of misconceptions around this is that there are no legal obligation whatsoever to join UPOV. And India is a living proof of this. It is a member of the World Trade Organization. And while its legislation is not UPOV compliant, it fulfills the requirements of the TRIPS agreement. The third related point is that once a country joins UPOV, there is no legal obligation to shift to UPA of 1991. Um, I've seen references um, to so-called transition period towards UPA of 91. That simply does not exist. And Norway is a apt reminder that the country can choose to remain party to UPA of 78. But that of course is only an option for those countries who are still a member of UPA of 78. And there are 17 of them. Um, now, while there is no obligation, there certainly is a lot of pressure which brings me to my fourth point, which, which is that uh, trade agreements are one of the main instruments used to put pressure on countries, especially in global south to join UPOV 91. And um, larger countries like Brazil and India or countries like New Zealand are in a better position to either walk out or negotiate the right to remain a party to UPOV 78, but this is much more difficult for smaller countries that are more vulnerable to political and trade pressures. Fifth, um, my fifth uh, point is that the strengthening of planned breeders' rights in UPA of 91 are extremely controversial and contested um, everywhere. Restriction on farmers' rights over protected varieties in particular are um, the most disputed aspect. And it, it's interesting to note that seeds are a very powerful symbol that has the potential to bring together diverse sectors of society. So farmers, of course, but also urban consumers and family farmers, as well as large farmers, as, as we've seen in the case of Brazil. And it's also the case in um, other countries like Argentina, for example. Now, farmers' rights and ability to save an exchange sheet is essential to the maintenance of farmer managed or peasant seed systems. And um, these systems in turn play a key role in farmers' livelihoods, in food production, and in the preservation of agricultural biodiversity. And this is true everywhere, but it is especially um, the case in the global south where seed saving practices are more widespread. Finally, the last point I would like to make is that resistance is not futile. So all four countries I discussed today have to varying degrees successfully resisted the um, strengthening of time breeders' rights. Three of them will not be joining UPOV 91 in the near future. And even if New Zealand is moving towards UPOV 91, um, it is doing so to some extent on its own terms. Importantly, this is due to civil society mobilization, particularly among farmers. So as we've seen, the government of India was initially intent on introducing legislation based on UPOV 78. And the PPV and FR Act is, was the result of public mobilization. Same thing with Norway, whose government considered moving towards UPOV 91 before eventually coming around following public consultation. So I think I'll stop here and uh, turn it over to Cam Goff. We'll talk about how some of these issues have played out um, in the Canadian context. Thanks very much, Karine, for this uh, excellent and informative presentation. Um, now I would like to invite former NFU President Cam Goff to give a brief history of um, UPOV in Canada and its implications for Canada's seed business and our public seed development system. He will also outline recent and ongoing attempts to privatize Canada's seed system that threaten our public interest seed institutions. Cam? Hi, folks. Uh, glad to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I guess uh, I farm just southeast of Saskatoon uh, with my brothers on a family farm, conventional farm, um, 
fertilizer, pesticides, etc. Strictly green, uh, and have been farming since uh, 1975. So uh, basically, the NFU has been fighting UPOV for over three years, and that fight has basically been spearheaded by uh, former uh, NFU President Terry Bame. Uh, Canada first tried passing UPOV 91 in 2005, but basically the opposition uh, that appeared uh, when, the, when they started to talk about it was such that uh, they just gave up. Uh, however, in uh, about 2015, the Harper Conservatives uh, decided that uh, they had to push the legislation through and they promised that no regulations would be passed uh, until consultations were held. And that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has actually been true. There are currently no uh, UPOV 91 specific regulations uh, that have been uh, brought uh, into force in, in Canada. Uh, now, under UPOV 91, the Canada Gazette process for changing regulations uh, basically can be used to try and stop these regulatory changes that will restrict farm saved seeds. Uh, first, basically by uh, preventing the regulations from going ahead. And then the ultimate goal would be to remove the power to regulate farm saved seed restrictions from legislation, which currently it is allowed, it just hasn't been enacted yet. Uh, which goes to what Kareem says about uh, there is no requirement for countries that sign on to UPOV 9 to actually uh, enact their regulations. But of course, there is a huge pressure from multi multinationals and uh, seed, seed companies to, you know, to bring these regulations into force so that they can you know, make more money. And basically, as farmers, as people who are fighting this, we have to ensure that the government does, does not use its regulatory powers that exist within the act to restrict farm saved seed. And then, you know, as I said, we can work to get the act changed. Uh, the UPOV mechanisms basically started in 1961 in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, UPOV is based in Geneva and produces template leg legislation for countries to follow. But as Karina said, they're not obligated to. Now, with the implementation of UPOV 91, we have seen a fundamental diminishment of what farmers can do with seed and the transfer of almost all the rights to plant breeders and private companies away from farmers. Now, although Canada's current PBR regime provides the option of farmer's privilege, and once again, Karina is very correct in pointing out that they're talking about privilege and not a right, uh, that privilege can be modified, changed, or eliminated based upon whatever regulations the government feels uh, it can pass or it feels it's obligated to pass because of the pressure from other countries or the, the large corporations. Uh, now this is a very fragile privilege and it does replace the age old practice ever since people started agriculture 10,000 years ago that we've used for saving, reusing and selling seeds to neighbors and beyond. Uh, so not only has this age old right uh, been taken away, but it has been criminalized under UPOV 91 or could be criminalized under UPOV 91. The end game is to make it habitual uh, for farmers to purchase seeds so that they have to do it. And if they don't, they will not have access to new varieties. And this has, you know, basically had some people say, well, you know, it won't affect me for 10 years or five years because that's about how long it takes to introduce a new variety in Canada from start to finish, basically, from when they start breeding to when it's, uh, it's concluded. However, that process is speeding up with new uh, new genetic technologies. So uh, it's you know it may not affect a person immediately, but rest assured, uh, if those uh, leg regulations are passed by governments, they will uh, affect us in the medium to long term. Now, in regards to uh, what's been going on now, um, basically there were very uh, comprehensive consultations with the uh, plant breeders and others prior to 2009. 
And at the end of 2009, the CFIA stated that Canada's variety registration system, uh, the purpose of variety registration is to provide government oversight to ensure that health and safety requirements are met and that information related to the identity a variety of a variety is available to regulators to prevent fraud. It also facilitates seed certification, the international trade of seed, and the tracking and tracing of varieties in commercial channels. Basically, the CFIA recognized that Canada has built a brand reputation on quality of their of their crops. And over, with variety registration, the certification of seed and quality assurance are all provided through organizations like the Canadian Grain Commission. And all of that has contributed to the building of a basically best in the world for Canada brand and reputation for the crops they, uh, they produce. However, uh, this seemed to be too much regulation for the Harper Conservatives and they started to push to have Canada sign on to the UPOV 91 framework and to change our variety registration system away from one based on merit to one based simply on the need or desire to register a variety of crop. Now, they were successful in signing Canada onto UPOV 91, but thankfully they actually failed in their attempt to throw our variety registration system open to any and all submissions. In Western Canada, uh, the Prairie Grain Development Committee, or PGDC, uh, structure was maintained, and the four recommending committees that are formed under that umbrella are still in the best position to test, evaluate, and recommend grain crop cultivars for Western Canada. Now, these committees consist of scientists, plant breeders, industry, and farmers that discuss and vote on every newly submitted variety only allowing their admission into the system if they actually provide an improvement on current varieties. Now, unfortunately, I'm not sure how closely the Cistern and Eastern Canada compares to the West, but I feel that in the West, we certainly have a good system that makes sure that varieties that are recommended are actually you know, superior and worthwhile for farmers to grow. But of course, there are a lot of ways to get what you want if you're a multinational. And then after failing to remove the varietal registration system's protection of merit-based decisions, they decided to turn to UPOV 91's provisions and the government of Canada's unwillingness to provide public plant breeding because the government of Canada has basically been undermining the public system for all well, ever since the mid nineties uh, with uh, taking away um, funding for the various uh, organizations that did the plant breeding and now currently uh, actually trying to basically undo uh, the progress that we, that we had made over the past hundred years. Now combining these two factors, uh, they, the multinationals quite easily convinced the government that it would be in everyone's interest if the government only did the hard pre-release breeding work and then basically handed those half-finished varieties over to the multinationals so they could then sell them to farmers. And uh, basically, uh, they also wanted to enact UP the UPOV regulations that had not been enacted and this would allow them to charge farmers the seed royalty on farm saved seed. Uh, well, thankfully, I mean, farmers rose up and managed uh, for the moment to quash both of these ideas, uh, but we're only partway through the war. Uh, immediately upon this defeat, the companies turned to contract law to obtain their piece of flesh and have started a system where certain varieties require a contract to be signed that requires a seed royalty, be, or seed royalty pardon me, to be paid. And these are called the Seed Variety Use Agreement or SVUA, and they first came into force in Canada last year. Uh, fortunately, they do not apply to public varieties, but they are able to be applied to varieties that come into Canada uh, from other countries. Or I'm sorry they to interrupt. Been delivered. Yep. Um, you have two minutes. Two minutes? Okay, that's great. Uh, so we started a system where certain varieties require a contract to be signed that 
Act uh, requires a seed royalty, which means the company's foot is stuck in the door and it's going to be tough to do. Um, currently, multinationals are counting on these are, uh, new, two new initiatives to give them access to the profits they feel they're due. The seed royalty modernization process and the Canada Grain Act review. As Karina said, large companies play the long game and they have almost unlimited funds and personnel to back their game. We have to continue to fight it for our rights and realize that we're in it for the long haul. And as Karina said, once again, resistance is not futile. We just have to keep on going. So thank you very much.